perhaps you know as society tilts in that more agreeable direction as uh you know, more and more women uh, occupy positions of power and get a bit more um, prominence in society and cultural messaging then someone like andrew tate comes along and sort of occupies that other sort of more masculine um uh, end of the spectrum of you know extreme disagreeableness of being more confrontational or hostile and uh you know naturally uh young males i think will a lot of them will be drawn to that not all but a lot of them and and then you don't want someone who just wants to get along and to be nice right right uh, and so young men have that sort of wired into them to some extent and uh and i think yeah someone like andrew tate it kind of speaks to that 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 part of part of young men that uh you know society hasn't uh hasn't extinguished Hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and Thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money Show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm going to do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by N. Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early-stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early-stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Rob Henderson, welcome to the What Is Money Show. Hey, Robert. Great to be here. It's great to have you. Um, We're going to talk about a a very interesting topic today, Uh, but just by way of quick introduction, you are a writer and a psychologist. Uh, You've got a fairly popular substack uh, just under Rob Henderson's newsletter, I believe is the title. And I, as I was mentioning to you offline, I've become very fascinated with the work of Rene Girard, who talks about uh, the nature of mimesis, right? That humans imitate one another and, and all of the consequences that arise from that. It's a very strange sort of thesis. It's one of these things that feels like it's hidden in plain sight, but I definitely feel like the more I get into it, the more it's changing the way I see the world. Um, and you know we talk we talk a lot about economics on the show and we talk about exchange as in the exchange of goods and serv- goods and services but this seems to be like an even more fundamental act of exchange where humans are basically imitating one another in every interaction so like an exchange of cultural data or something like that so um i want to get your perspectives on this and i know you, you've got some high level thoughts. So maybe we could just start with what is mimesis? How do we hey. crack this open for a general audience or people that have, may have never heard of it? And, um, and what are your views on Gerard's thesis at a high level? Yeah. You know, so I am, I am, uh, far from a, a, a Girardian expert. I have some sort of cursory understanding of, of Rene Girard's ideas. Um, 
I I read Wanting by Luke Burgess, which was excellent. I listened to uh, to Jonathan B's lectures on YouTube. Uh, there's a really nice sort of introductory essay from Alex Danko. Um, I think if you just Google Alex Danko Girard, that you know that um, essay will pop up. Um, so I have some you know awareness and understanding of it. Mimesis, you know, if I recall correctly, Mimesis is something along the lines of uh, of imitation. Uh, how we come to want to imitate uh, what others want, and this has the capacity to potentially spiral out of control and gradually over time we uh we ended up wanting to uh wanting the same thing and society can unravel as the result of this and this leads to that sort of scapegoat mechanism and this sort of reestablishes uh peace but you know the Gerard's ideas at a, at a kind of higher level I think at least my understanding from from Jonathan B's work is that there are sort of two forms of of desire um I may be miss remembering the terms here but there's one form of desire which is sort of authentic desire you want it because you actually want it you you know you want this car because you want the car because you naturally intrinsically find it desirable and then there's that sort of mimetic desire which is you don't really want that car that much you want that car because everyone else wants that car right. uh, in a sort of objective impartial perspective if you just saw that car on its own removed from the social context it wouldn't hold that much attraction to you but once you learn that all of your friends and all of the cool and popular and interesting people think that this car is worth having, suddenly you want it and everyone else starts to want it too. And I think that's sort of my understanding of, of mimesis. Yeah, that's, that's a great point there. Um, so yeah, I, I forget the terms that are used as well, but there is kind of like an instinctual desire or, mm. that you just want, the, like a, as a basic appetite, right? You smell the food and you want to eat it. It's not necessarily mm. relevant to a social context. But then some of these other items, we we actually cultivate desire based on what we see other people desiring. So it becomes a, uh, like something we want, perhaps related to what we call conspicuous consumption in economics, right? We want the cool car because it's the cool car. Everyone wants it. Everyone's driving it. It's a status symbol, et cetera. And I think about- yeah, this is a really- Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, there's, there's a really nice, uh, there's a book from uh, uh, Jeffrey Miller, the evolutionary psychologist, uh, called Spent. Uh, and it's uh, it sort of takes an evolutionary psychological look at consumer behavior. And one of the things he points out in this book is that, you know, people will ask, why do like high-end luxury brands advertise in places and outlets and areas where people likely couldn't afford it? Mm -hmm. You know, you're sort of, um, you go to a grocery store and you see a magazine and Maybe the types of people who shop at this store couldn't necessarily afford a, you know, Lamborghini or a Lexus or um, whatever the latest sort of handbags are. And Miller points out that the reason why they advertise everywhere is not so much to get you to buy that brand, but it's sort of brand reinforcement. It's it's to remind everyone that these are the desirable brands, and you should want them, and everyone wants them. And you see the, you know, how slick and shiny it is right next to some kind of celebrity model. And it reminds you, you know, yeah, you can't afford it, but this is the cool thing. And you should remember that this is cool. And that's actually the purpose of a lot of this advertising. Interesting. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting look at it. I was going to say that um, I'm reminded here in terms of mimetic desire, like people wanting what other people want. It's, mm. I guess there's some signal coming through that. And I think about this in terms of the nature of celebrity. You know, like, mm -hmm. there's like kind of a flywheel effect once someone becomes so famous, they're just, well, they have all this attention magnified on them. So everyone is in awe of them, right? Even if, if you run into Brad Pitt on the street, you're just like, oh my God, it's Brad Pitt. It's like, even if you're not a Brad Pitt fan or whatever, you just would notice that he's so noticed. There's like this mimetic desire surrounding celebrities in that way. And I think you also see it on social media or you're more likely to follow someone who has a lot of followers already. You know, you're taking that as a right. signal of, oh, well, this guy is socially validated in some way. So maybe I, you know, what a, the crowd is telling me something that maybe I don't see. So I should just kind of jump on the bandwagon type of effect. Yeah. You know, I, it, it's funny. So the other day I was, uh, I was walking uh, with my girlfriend uh, through a shopping mall and Somehow, you know, I, you know, because I, I think about these these things a lot too. And uh, we walked by the 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 tag. I think it's called Tag Heuer. The German is like Tag Heuer, the the watch yes. uh, brand, wristwatch brand. And they used to have DiCaprio, uh, and now they have Ryan Gosling. So I don't know. Did, did Ryan Gosling become cooler than DiCaprio? I don't know. What's <laughs> draw there, but suddenly Gosling is the the guy holding the watch, maybe because he's in the Ken or the, the Barbie movie. Um, 
And, and you know, all it is is Gosling with, with the watch. That's all it is. It doesn't even say this is Ryan Gosling. You already know who he is. And all you have to do is pair the image of the celebrity with the wristwatch and enough said, right? Suddenly the watch becomes desirable. That's that sort of mimetic uh, uh, drive underlying that. And, you know, it reminds me of, um, so about 10 years ago, uh, Angelina Jolie wrote this op-ed in the New York Times. Uh, it was something about her um, uh, getting screened for breast cancer and getting mastectomy. And, uh, and the article went viral. And some researchers actually looked at um, whether this had any effect on the number of women receiving breast cancer screenings. And they found this uh, uh, significant increase in the number of women who decided to get uh, breast cancer screenings uh, as a result of this op-ed. And at first glance, it doesn't really, you know, like a, a doctor didn't write that op-ed. It wasn't, uh, you know, some some scientist or a physician or a researcher. It was a female celebrity with an extremely well-known name. And simply because of that name recognition and her star power, this was enough to encourage lots of women to say, oh, Al Angelina Jolie is getting breast cancer screening, so I should do it too. And so the researchers dubbed this the Angelina effect, that you know, mm -hmm. just because she did this thing, and she sort of used her celebrity for something good, not to you know sell consumer products or something. But that's sort of an example of that, uh, the power of, I think, you know, the, what, like the sort of ben benevolent aspect of, of mimesis is, you know, this, this celebrity is doing this good thing, so you should do it too. Um, on the follower point, you know, I, I read this article, I can't remember which outlet it was in, but it was about, you know, how a lot of people, in influencers included, their, you know, of course, follower count matters a lot, but there's this shift. I don't know how widespread it is or how serious it is about how it's not so much now how many followers you have, but it's who's following you. That becomes more important, you know. It's better to have, you know, it's better to have one follower if that one follower is um, uh, Kendrick Lamar or something versus 10,000 nobodies. Quality yeah, so over quantity. One kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and I think there's something to that. If I see someone who has 10,000 followers, but I have no idea who any of them are, I've never heard of this person, yeah, that's one thing. But if I see a person with one follower, at first I'll be like, one follower? Okay. And then I find out it's Kendrick Lamar. I'm like, oh, who is this person? You know what I mean, <laughs> yeah, there's yeah, that yeah. sort of, yeah, the, the quality over quantity. Yeah, that's a great point too. Um, uh, uh, the Angelina effect is interesting to me. I think it, it probably speaks to the underlying purpose of advertising. Maybe not all advertising, but celebrity advertising in particular. I'm reminded here when I talk to, I guess it doesn't have to just be celebrity. Because John Verveke brought up this idea of the beer commercial, right? Like you always see a bunch of people hanging out at a bar, everyone's smiling and laughing and drinking, like having a really good time. Everyone's good looking and they're tan and they're like, there are a lot of good vibes. And you see the commercial, you see the billboard and you know it's not like that. Like when you actually go to a bar and people are sitting around drinking beer, there's not like everyone's just complete. I mean, sometimes, but <laughs> not typically people are just like laughing and all attractive and having a good time. He goes, but there's this subconscious element where you're just automatically subconsciously associating these good emotions, good vibes, attractive people with the beer brand. And so the the point of the advertising is kind of like subconsciously program you by just making the association. It's not really it's not really addressing you consciously per se, probably similar to the handbags you described, like just getting the image in people's mind, imprinted in people's mind through repetition. Um then when you go to make passes. yeah, and then when you go to make these buying uh, choices, you know people aren't really pouring a lot of thought into what they're buying, especially if it's something low ticket like beer. They're just going to maybe buy the thing that is at top of mind, sort of thing. So there's this competition in the attention space of people to try and get your brand associated with whatever outcome, presumably, you're trying to sell. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking about like Coca-Cola commercials too. At least there was one I remember a few years ago. Uh, it was pretty popular. It would play in, in in the movie theaters of you know just people on roller skates in in a circle or on the beach and mm -hmm. you know playing uh, volleyball and it's just all you know this 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 Coca-Cola commercial and it's you know 99.99 percent of people who are drinking a Coca-Cola have it's like the you know very far from what what that experience is like. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's it sort of, you can't help but put those images in your mind that Coca-Cola is about having fun, having a good time, <laughs> having with your friends and, <laughs> and yeah, it, and it, it sort of bypasses rational thought. There's a, there's a sort of an interesting, um, like, uh, like psychoanalytic perspective. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm not an expert in this, but, but my understanding of someone like Jacques Lacan and, mm -hmm. and his, um, uh, protégés 
they have this idea of like a lot of advertising isn't just what it's ostensibly about, like the the beer commercial of all these attractive people. Mm -hmm. um, it's not to sell the beer. A secondary effect is also to remind you that this is what an attractive person looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, and even the, the creators of the ad themselves don't understand that this is what they're doing, that they're sort of reinforcing the sort of cultural norm of, you know, when you when you go out after after work to happy hour, you know, you're supposed to go to a bar, you're supposed to be with friends. It's sort of reinforcing these sort of implicit ideas about what fun looks like and what good, good, attractive, uh, uh, excited, enthusiastic people look like, too. Um, from the clothes they're wearing to the, the 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 style of their hair and all these other things too, and uh, yeah, I, I think that that, that may be um, yeah not not another conscious decision, but it is something that people implicitly pick up from this is like oh this is like you know hot girls on roller skates drinking Coca Cola right. and the Coca Cola ad isn't selling Coca Cola it's selling you this is what a hot chick looks like yes yes yeah and the, cleverly disguising the actual consequences of drinking coca-cola every day like diabetes <laughs> <laughs> obesity yeah, yeah right yeah I, you brought up lacan i read one of his books the title escapes me at the moment but one the one thing that really stood out from his book for me was the mirror stage he described i think it was toddlers or young adolescents they they sort of they learn through imitating adults, right? The adults that are around them. And, you know, it's not, they don't do what they are told per se. They do what they see other people doing in a way. And I wonder if that has some crossover with mimesis that, mm -hmm. you know, in a way toddlers sort of, they come online, if you will, by imitating their parents or their caretakers or the, whatever, whatever influences typically older people are in their life around them. And then I think that seems to just extend into adulthood actually like i've noticed since i've started reading about mimesis i've found little behavioral quirks like either a facial expression that i'll make or the way i'll say something or a phrase that i'll use and i've identified that in someone else like i got that from a friend you know three or five years ago or from a or i'm running a program that my you know mother or father may have instilled in me at a young age do you think that that there's some validity to that, that people, you know, the, the, actually uh, Gerard's book opens with the, this quote from Aristotle that man differs from the other animals in his greater aptitude for imitation. And so it's like almost how we pass cultural, we transmit cultural knowledge or behavioral knowledge, procedural knowledge, something like that across time is through imitation. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would love to hear your thoughts yeah. about that. Yeah, I mean, the, that quote is, is spot on. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I find Girard and Girardian ideas so uh, compelling is because, you know, for me, I, you know, I studied a lot of social and evolutionary psychology when I was doing my PhD. That's sort of my area of, of expertise. And so, you know, by the time I came to Girard, I had already read, you know, uh, uh, hundreds of books and papers and so on, and articles about uh, the, and the human ancestral environment, the... Uh, uh, circumstances in which sort of humans arose and what early human communities look like and and what uh, existing current hunter-gatherer societies look like today and how they are similar and differ from uh, those of the past. And so when I read about Gerard speaking of uh, man as an animal that is sort of an uh, expert in imitation, it's true. I mean, if you look at a lot of research in evolutionary and developmental psychology, uh, humans are high fidelity imitators. Mm. Uh, we're more, um, you know, we, we have this phrase monkey see, monkey do. Mm -hmm. And it's actually not the case. Monkeys don't see monkeys, you know, it's, it's humans. Humans are the ones who see something and immediately imitated at a very high level of refinement. And so there's some classic studies, for example, um, you know, if you take a, a, you know, a chimpanzee, uh, an adult chimpanzee, or, or even a, a juvenile, and you give them a little contraption and then they watch uh, a human being, you know, the, the experimenter, you know, they go through a series of steps with this little device, this contraption. Most of it is superfluous. It's unnecessary. And then there's one necessary action to get this piece of food out of this contraption. Um, the chimpanzee will observe and then the experimenter will give the device with a little piece of food in it to the chimpanzee. And the chimp will only do that one thing. They'll, they'll skip all the superfluous little actions, the mm. steps, uh, and just take the food out. Um, if you show a child three or four years old, uh, the same set of procedures, the experimenter does all the superfluous actions and then do the one thing to get the little piece of candy out, uh, the three or four year old will do all of those steps. 
um, mm -hmm. step by step. They'll copy very carefully, um, often unthinkingly, uh, and that's because humans are, you know, we're, we're high fidelity imitators. And the reason for this is uh, evolutionary researchers think this was for survival reasons. Um, you know, throughout evolutionary history, it was very important for for human beings uh, to have culture to very quickly. Uh, uh, we, if a human discovered something new, something useful, something important, uh, a new way to build a tool or, or to identify uh, how to prepare certain kinds of food mm. or medicine and so on, uh, it was important for the others to quickly um, uh, register this and do it themselves. Um, and it's often unthinking. Uh, and so in the past, it was often very beneficial. Uh, so we have this, um, there are sort of two biases humans have for imitation, we are biased towards imitating uh, prestigious individuals, mm -hmm. uh, high status people. So in the ancestral environment, these were sort of the leaders, the big men, the head men, uh, people who were very talented hunters or navigators or storytellers or, or medicine men, witch doctors, or women who were uh, experts at you know, child rearing and these kinds of things. So, so, and, and so it was, it was useful for survival in that context. Um, though today we still have that sort of, uh, uh, psychological machinery operating that, oh, someone is high status. And we just naturally assume that if someone is prestigious, that must mean they have acquired that status for useful mm -hmm. reasons. Uh, if you think about it consciously, often you understand that they don't, but the fact that so many people are paying attention to them, there's that sort of mim mimetic piece there that, oh, everyone's paying attention to them. They're important. They're doing something. I'll do it too. Um, and so, so we have that sort of prestige bias, and then we just have this bias where if lots of people are doing something, then we'll naturally uh, uh, follow it too. And so if you see a lot of people engaging in the same behavior, um, we can't help but sort of um, uh, be drawn into it and, and do the same thing. I mean, you may have seen some of these videos, you know, there's this old sort of can camera show from the 1960s where like, um, you know, a guy would enter an elevator that's full of people and they're facing one way. And then all, you know, it's, it's yeah. rigged. And then all the people turn around, the guy turns around too, confused, like, oh, everyone's <laughs> turning around, I'll turn around. And then they, you know, do this a couple of times. And, you know, that was a, a, an adaptive survival behavior in the ancestral environment. Most of the time, if you do what the people around you are doing, you will survive. Um, yes. But today we live in a very different uh, circumstance, right? We have this sort of evolutionary mismatch where the environment we're in now is different. And so we end up copying influencers and people who um, maybe aren't doing something that quite as useful as the prestigious people in, in, in the past. Yeah, no, there's a lot of great points there. I think that we see this even in sort of micro behaviors where like if everyone, like you're in, a, you're in a group of people and everyone looks up suddenly in one direction, you know, like you're just immediately subconsciously gripped to kind of look that direction too. You want to see what, what all the fuss is about. And then you see it in sort of longer, more thoughtful decisions too, like fashion, right? Like if you... Hmm you go to a place where people dress differently, like almost inevitably after a few months there, you're going to kind of start to adopt their dress. Um, I had friends in school, they would go and spend summers abroad. You know, they'd go spend a summer in England or whatever. When they come back, you know, I was in Tennessee at the time. When they leave, they have kind of a Southern accent. They come back three months later. Granted, this was a kid, so they're probably more malleable. They have like a slightly different accent, like the way they talked was different. So it's interesting that all these little situations where people just sort of unconsciously emulate one another. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. It looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high res three inch touch screen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility, and it's a really a, a brand new UI UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self-custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code Bitcoin23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. I think mm -hmm. I have a question about this. So I can't help but wonder how much incentives and or let's say technological realities influence uh, mimesis. Because like you said, 
were more prone to imitate prestigious people. But someone that was prestigious in the age of the hunter-gatherer, right, was probably like the best hunter, right? The guy that could throw the spear the furthest or, or what otherwise trap or kill animals most uh, proficiently. Whereas in like the modern day, you know, like someone that's prestigious might be an investment banker, right? Or, or a statesman, something like that. So I wonder if as our technological realities change, that the behaviors that actually promote us to positions of prestige obviously change, right? Throwing a spear doesn't get you a lot of prestige in 2023 in most places. Yeah. Um, and so I wonder if the actual incentive, either the incentive schemas we're inhabiting or maybe just the technological realities we're living under influence who becomes prestigious and therefore influences the messages that are, that are being propagated to others as to what behaviors to emulate. Um, mm. And on that yeah, note, I mean, like, I'm, I'm just really curious about that because I wonder how something like Bitcoin could change things. When I, like, you look at the world today and you have a guy like Putin, uh, rumor is he has like a $200 billion net worth, right? He's, that net worth has been created as a statesman, right? He's extracted wealth through taxation and coercion and all these things. And in a Bitcoin world, it would be much more difficult for a guy to get that wealthy through extraction and coercion. So maybe it would be, maybe people would be less, he would be less prestigious in that world. So therefore people would imitate those actions less. So therefore we'd have like a more peaceful, more uh, entrepreneur led world, let's say people imitating guys like Elon versus Putin for, for instance. Anyways, that's just kind of a theory of mine. And I wanted to like bounce it off of you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, so so I think like that. Yeah, the the way you ended it, I, I definitely agree with that. That um, you know, you suggest uh, at the end there that you know that that imitation and impulse is never going to go away. It's just how it's channeled. You know, maybe yeah. at the moment people are sort of channeling that impulse, not consciously, not deliberately, but it's just sort of we naturally gravitate towards imitating people who are high status, who have a lot of prominence. A lot of people are paying attention to them. And then gradually, you know, or or you know, d depending on who's who's the prestigious person of that time, will sort of shift our our attention away. Um, yeah, I mean, I think technology and societal changes over time definitely affect you know who we're paying attention to, who we think is important, and you know, for you know, it's, I think in some cases in the modern context, it's a good thing. Um, you know, just. Not, not, you know, for, for us, it's a long time ago, but in the context of human history, the age of dueling, uh, wasn't that long ago. Mm -hmm. And that used to be, um, confined to the aristocratic classes or the people who had money, you know, usually the dueling started, you know, the, 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 the of two guys with the guns, you know, uh, pulling them out and seeing who could kill the other first mm -hmm. that started with the aristocratic class, uh, in the, um, uh, 18th and 19th centuries. And then it sort of gradually spread to everyone else. And then, um, uh, interestingly, once once dueling spread throughout the population, then the aristocrats and the elites uh, eventually banned the practice of dueling, um, and so so that was like an example of like a kind of a harmful behavior uh, that started with the elites and then spread throughout as a result of that sort of mimetic process, and then gradually uh, it was abandoned. Um, but yeah, today it can it, yeah it can take on perverse forms, right? Like. Being an investment banker maybe isn't the worst thing, but then you know, being you know, trying to become someone like Vladimir Putin <laughs> would be very bad. Uh, and 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 there are sort of better and worse ways of of how mimesis works. I think we all kind of intuitively understand this, right? When we see a prominent person get a lot of fame or notoriety for things that we disagree with or that we think may be harmful or that behavior could spread. Um, often other people of prominence try to circle the wagons and try to, uh, uh, stigmatize that person or silence that person or, or, or spread the word that this is someone you, you want to avoid. Um, you know, I'm thinking just over the last few weeks, few months, whatever of uh, like, you know, someone like Andrew Tate, who, you know, suddenly was like the biggest person on TikTok for a while. Mm -hmm. And then all of these other outlets started to, to, um, sort of run interference and, and try to, uh, do, do some, some kind of, uh, message controls. You know, hey, all these young guys are listening to this guy. So be careful or whatever. So yeah, mimesis, uh, it operates in interesting ways. And I, yeah, people intuitively understand how it works, I think. Yeah. That's, it's fascinating because if that is the case, then we could maybe consciously engineer 
the behaviors that are being imitated by changing the incentive structures. Mm-hmm. And because all of a sudden you're like, if, if in a society that rewards and promotes entrepreneurship rather than statecraft, let's say, um, then you could actually create more entrepreneuring, right? More innovation, more, uh, productivity and imp- improvement and whatnot, just by rewarding entrepreneurship, uh, you know, low to low and predictable taxes, things like this, things that actually benefit, uh, the productive class, let's say mm-hmm. those people would then by necessity become more rich, more prestigious. And then that would propagate this cultural signal for other people to emulate that. Whereas in this al- alternative world where you have high taxes, you know, a lot of coercion, a lot of violence, you're going to get more Putins running around basically. So it seems like yeah. th- there's the possibility that we could consciously participate in what is mimetically propagating throughout society. And that's really interesting to me. I think there's something to that, um, generally speaking, uh, but at least like in, so, so I think like, yeah, we can consciously, and I think we do this to some extent, you know, certain kinds of elite factions who have the capacity to broadcast messages, you know, we do ch- pick and choose to some extent, you know, who we want to talk about and write about and speak with and, and give a sort of signal boost their, their image and their reputation and their ideas. Um, but because we live in a you know, relatively free society, um, you know, other people with, uh, with large platforms can also choose whether they want to stigmatize that person that you like or choose their own person who they want to prop up, right? So maybe one faction wants to, you know, write writes a, a nice profile piece of someone like Elon Musk, and then another faction that also has a large platform can can stigmatize that kind of behavior and say, actually, we should be, you know, well, taxation and coercion are good things. And here's yeah. this person who really thinks that those are good. And so we have this sort of constant churning and conflict and so on, which I guess is, in a way, that's sort of an inevitable part of living in a you know, relatively free society is that people can sort of pick and choose who they want to glorify. Um, but generally, yeah, I'm, I'm with you that uh, we can, I think we can be more careful and more deliberate about sort of who we pay attention to, who we confer status to, who we uh, attempt to, you know, uh, uh, lionize. Yes. Yes. Gr- great point there. And you brought up Andrew Tate as well. That might be possibly that's a case of, cause it's not just, uh, mimesis. There's actually anti-mimesis too. And I, I think about this in terms of a lot of people, there's a saying that, you know, most people become their parents as they get older, but there's all, there also seems to be in the reflecting on my own life and, and, uh, people that I know closely, I know a lot of people, I'd say it's almost 50, 50. I know a lot of people that sort of imitate behaviors of their parents as they get older, but I know a lot of people too, that, that do the opposite of what their parents did, right? Like maybe their mother or father was a smoker or a drinker, and then they grow up and they do the exact opposite. I'm reading a book about Rockefeller right now. And Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller's father was a known charlatan. Like he would go out into the world and like, he's like your stereotypical snake oil salesman. He would go and sell these, you know, he'd buy um, diuretics at a pharmacy and he'd go sell them as like a panacea on the road. And he'd come back with all these wads, big wads of cash from scamming people. And then sure enough, John D. Rockefeller grows up and he's, he tries to do the opposite, right? He tries, he's very, um, very religious, tries to be very truthful, very, you know, is very, um, diligent in maintaining his ledger all the time. So he's, he almost like does the opposite of what his father did. And so with, with the Andrew Tate thing, it's like, we've had this general societal tilt away from masculinity, right? Like masculinity is toxic and bad and we all need to be a little bit more effeminate and caring about one another's gender identity or whatever. And he, there's like an anti-memetic response in the popularity of a guy like Andrew Tate being like, no, fuck that. Like we need really strong men. You should stand up for yourself, be responsible, you know, work hard. Well, all the messages he's promoting, um, does that resonate with anything uh, in your studies of, of evolutionary biology that, that maybe we see people that tend to go one direction, but there's all, there can also be kind of this counter move that results from uh, maybe moves that are too sudden uh, one way or the other. Yeah, you know, in terms of the sort of social psychology of it, nothing immediately comes to mind about sort of backlash that's sort of, you know, I've been thinking about like in philosophy, that sort of Hegelian dialectic of the Mm -hmm. thesis and the antithesis and that sort of churning 
But in terms of um, like at the individual level, why someone would choose to resist or, or do the opposite of their parents or what society is telling them or whatever sort of cultural messaging uh, people are attempting to sort of implant in them. You know, there's that sort of personality trait of agreeableness. You know, those are the, 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 at the moment, the most sort of widely accepted model of personality in psychology is the big five, uh, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and eroticism. And agreeableness is uh, essentially, you know, somewhat simplifying of just how much you kind of go along with the crowd, how much you value sort of social harmony and good vibes and just sort of not making waves. And you know, so it exists on a spectrum, right? That's sort of the extreme end of agreeableness is just, you know, being a very sort of kind, nice person going with the flow, not making any waves. And then at the other end is the sort of disagreeableness aspect. And this is someone who's sort of, uh, you know, hard headed or stubborn or, or, you know, they're, they're sort of positive ways to spend that sort of an independent thinker or someone who's willing to sort of stand outside of the crowd and, um, you know, to be, be willing to be a bit more assertive or aggressive uh, confrontational in some cases. And I think, um, you know, maybe when society goes too far in one direction, agreeableness, there, so there is a sex difference in agreeableness. Women are more agreeable on average than men. Doesn't mean that yeah. there aren't more women who are agreeable, but exist on overlapping bell curves. But usually the women are more agreeable. And perhaps, you know, as society tilts in that more agreeable direction, as uh, you know, more and more women uh, occupy positions of power and get a bit more. Um, prominence in society and cultural messaging. And someone like Andrew Tate comes along and sort of occupies that other sort of more masculine um, uh, end of the spectrum of, you know, extreme disagreeableness, of being more confrontational or hostile. And, uh, you know, naturally, uh, young males, I think, will a lot of them will be drawn to that. Not all, but a lot of them. And in the disagreeability does sort of shift over time in the lifespan within the same person. Usually, for young men, disagreeability peaks, you know, that willingness to be aggressive, assertive, confrontational, it peaks in the late teens and the early 20s. Uh Um, And there may be some interesting sort of evolutionary reasons for this that, you know, you, especially in the ancestral environment, if you want someone to go hunt a dangerous animal or Mm -hmm. potentially uh, go to war against another Mm -hmm. coalition or another village, another tribe, you want a bit of that disagreeableness and then you don't want someone who just wants to get along and to be nice. Right, right. Uh, And so young men have that sort of wired into them to some extent. And, uh, and I think, yeah, someone like Andrew Tate, it kind of speaks to that, that, that part of, part of young men that, uh, you know, society hasn't, uh, hasn't extinguished. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great point. I'm reminded here too, one of the most common threads between Bitcoiners is that they tend to be extremely disagreeable. Yeah. Uh, I've done the big five personality test and I got a 1% on agreeableness. That was like my... My, by far my Robert, Robert I got to tell you so a friend of mine uh, who got me into like I'm not a you know a, a, an expert in Bitcoin but I have some Bitcoin and the reason is because a friend of mine uh, is really into Bitcoin uh, this Korean dude and he's he so he told me he's like I took the big five he was in the one percent yeah. <laughs> as well uh, I'm in the, the bottom ninth percent so I'm like I'm the low end of agreeableness but I'm not on the one percent but uh, I think you're right something about Bitcoiners yeah and I would explain too why there's a lot more men in Bitcoin than women, as you just said, men tend to be more disagreeable. Um, yeah. I wonder too. So, uh, as you were saying that, I was reflecting on like the way teenagers are typically they're stereotypically rebellious. You know, they want, um, and they kind of just flip into this mode when you get into, into your teenage years, right? Like I often hear about fathers of daughters being that I have a young daughter. They say just wait till she turns thirteen. You know, like they become very rebellious and. She goes from daddy's girl to I hate you for a few years. And then eventually, if you're lucky, she comes back around. Do you think there's an, an evolutionary impulse there? Maybe it's like as kids come into adolescence, they have this impulse to sort of be disagreeable with the family such that they branch out and find their own way. And that's like uh, a way to drive human populations out into new frontiers, something like that. Um, well, sort of at, at, at the individual level. So evolution, you know, the, the, the main currency is reproduction, right? Surviving offspring. You know, people talk about evolution in terms of survival and reproduction, but evolution doesn't, uh, you know, in quotes, care about survival nearly as much as it cares about reproduction, right? And so, you know, the, a simple example of this is a, a trait that aids in reproduction, but, but damages survival can still be passed on if the organism lives long enough to reproduce, 
So, you know, if you have a, like a human being who is, uh, you know, very interested in risk taking, uh, and that risk taking ability aids in the person's reproductive skills, they take more risks, maybe they get more food, they attract more mates, they're more impressive in some way. Um, even if they live a shorter life as a result of that, um, they may have more children than someone who's very risk averse, who doesn't take any risks. You know, they won't ask the girl out, won't do anything potentially, um, perilous. So, um, in terms of the, 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 like, there's a lot of interesting research. Um, Sarah Jane Blakemore, who's actually here at Cambridge, uh, she wrote a book on this on sort of adolescent psychology and how, um, yeah, usually there's this sort of shift away from, um, the parents and towards the peer group. Uh, where, you know, she's done some really interesting work on, you know, how much kids care about what their parents think of them versus what their friends think of them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from like, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine years old, kids care more about what their parents think than what their Mm -hmm. friends think. But then, yeah, once that's sort of pre-adolescent, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13, then suddenly it flips and kids care a lot more what their friends think than what their parents think. And there, there may be a kind of, um, an evolutionary impulse here of, um, you know, you want to look good to the opposite sex. Um, where status, uh, status is conferred through the peer group, through other boys, other girls, other young people, they can kind of decide to some extent, who's the cool one, who's the popular one, who's the one who, um, will have a higher chance of getting the girl or getting the guy. And it's not the parents, right? Um, now things are kind of tricky because in a lot of hunter gatherer societies, parents do actually hold quite a bit of sway in terms of, uh, who they're, you know, they're sort of arranged marriages and a lot of sort of influence there. But uh, even then, a lot of young people will kind of rebel. There are these interesting stories of, you know, arranged marriages, but then, you know, the, the son or the daughter kind of rebels against it and still manages to kind of sleep with someone on the side or sort of break out of that a little bit. And so the parents have to exert a lot of coercion to sort of contain that. Um, but I think there is that kind of evolutionary impulse that, you know, you're once you reach the stage of life where you're capable of reproducing, your parents aren't like... In, a, in an evolutionary sense, they're not that important anymore. Mm. Um, you're sort of old enough, you're big enough, you're strong enough, you're capable enough, and now you want to sort of behave in ways that will attract a mate rather than uh, curry favor with your parents. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. With Wasabi Wallet, you can receive, send, and store Bitcoin privately. In Wasabi Wallet, your transaction history and wallet balance are completely hidden. Wasabi Wallet is easy to use, all of its privacy features are built in by default, and it works with any amount of Bitcoin. Wasabi users can make CoinJoin transactions together with BTC Pay server users or Trezor Suite users. For BTC Pay server users, they can make payments directly inside of a CoinJoin, and for Trezor Suite users, you can make CoinJoins directly on a hardware wallet. These features result in the fee savings and security improvements for both sets of users. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the -the state-of-the-art Bitcoin privacy wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Casa. Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, today to sign up and use discount code breedlove any thoughts about how parents can navigate that tricky time of life with their teenagers because it it seems very challenging if it's an evolutionary impulse when kids are like look i don't i kind of don't need you anymore mom and dad i mean obviously that's not completely clear cut but at least from at least internally they maybe they're going through that they're, they're experiencing that motivation to move away from mom and dad into this broader social world, uh, you know, for purposes of reproduction, presumably. Mm-hmm. Are there any, any thoughts on how parents can sort of manage that transition, uh, thoughtfully and gracefully? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, it's so it's, it's hard right now because, uh, you know, there, there are things I suppose parents can do, um, 
you know, I, I guess like the, the most sort of obvious one is to just sort of let your kid know that you're there for them and that if they have questions, they can always come to you and sort of maintain that sort of open, open lines of communication. Um, but we live in a culture now that's sort of so open and so interconnected and, you know, the, the parents can sort of send messages and the kids may receive them, but they're receiving messages from everywhere else too, right? Online, smartphones, YouTube, algorithms, their friends, everything. And so I think it's, it's really hard to sort of compete with that. Um, but I think, yeah, the number one thing would be, yeah, maintaining the open lines of communication and even, you know, I, I don't know how I'm trying to think, you know, what if, how, how open a 13 year old would be to even receiving that message of like, like even explaining at a kind of a basic level, like what's actually going on biologically with them mm -hmm. that like, um, it, you know, because 13 year olds just don't like to hear from, you know, they don't want to be lectured at. So if you try to explain mm -hmm. like, biologically, here's what's going on with you right now, you may not fully understand it. That period of life is just so, um, so vivid and so intense. Every emotion you feel, um, it feels like it's, that's the only thing you'll ever feel when you're happy. You feel like you're going to be happy forever. When you're sad, you feel like you're just going to be depressed and down forever. And you don't yet have the context to understand that like emotions are fleeting. They pass, you know, relationships come and go and you have to sort of work at it. And, you know, it, it takes time to understand that. I think maybe one, this is just a speculation, you know, just, it would be maybe worth seeing, um, you know, sort of what they're interested in. Like what kind of thinkers they like um, or who they're drawn to and then to find whether those influencers or people they follow have messages that you agree with mm. you know if you can find a youtube so again i don't know your kid likes this influencer on youtube you follow that influencer you see like is there a video of this person saying something good about you know uh, uh being safe or being whatever whatever it is that you're interested in send that video to the kids say hey i saw this you know you're the influencer you like said this thing so sort of find the messages that you like from the source that they enjoy hearing from and send that to them. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, that way you're not lecturing to them, right? You're sort of speaking right. speaking to them in their own language or someone that they're already exactly. they already have affinity for. So you could sort of leverage that. I think it's a great point too you made on the just the temporal nature of emotions. Because that mm -hmm. almost sums up the teenage years, right? Like when you're in love with somebody, you're in love forever. We're gonna get whatever and then when you break up and you're heartbroken you're like i'm never gonna love anyone again never gonna be happy again yeah. yeah and they just haven't had enough experience of that emotional turbulence yet to know that it this too shall pass kind of thing um right. and maybe explaining that to them maybe like right before they go into the teenage years where you can maybe still they're still looking to you as you know mom and dad with all the answers and they care about what you think you kind of be like, look, the next few years are going to be tricky. You're going to feel a lot of feelings, and but just know here's kind of what's going on. Um, mm. That might be might be useful. Um, I like that. Yeah. So getting to them, maybe like eight, nine, ten years old. Yeah. 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 That's in, yeah. That's that's great. Yeah. I think that that could actually make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, okay. I've almost kept you long enough here, but you mentioned. You read the book Wanting. I read that book as well. I'd actually recommend that book before trying to read Gerard. Gerard's, well, specifically, I've only read Things Hidden Since the Foundation of the World. Very difficult book. Very good, but very dense and difficult. Wanting was much more accessible. I think he just explained it in uh, using modern analogies and, and whatnot. One of my favorite um, and I, actually this came from Gerard, but he mentioned it in the book Wanting, where Gerard talked about the nature of a handshake in trying to describe hmm. mimetic desire uh, and, its, and its relationship to ritual. So if someone extends their hand to shake your hand and you reciprocate, then you both sort of enjoy this ritual together. You share feelings of warmth and uh, friendliness, right? We've, we've met and exchanged and we're smiling and getting to know one another a little bit. There's a, there's a mimesis occurring, right? We're imitating one another in ritual mm -hmm. and sort of sharing, uh, this emotional charge of what it may be. Now, and Gerard makes this great point. If someone extends their hand to shake your hand and you refuse, then you're, you're propagating these feelings of sort of coldness or antipathy maybe towards that person, right? There's something wrong. There's a reason you refuse that handshake. And then immediately, and the person that extended their hand, they're going to have those feelings too, right? This person's rejecting my handshake for some reason. So he uses the, this little micro example of like a very 
clear cut case of how mimesis works that people mm-hmm. are either kind of in, engaging uh, with one another and and reciprocating emotions or if someone's denying it then they're still reciprocating emotions but in this case it's the opposite um i just wanted to throw that out as like one of the examples i thought was really useful and then uh hear hear your thoughts about it or if there's any other cases of, of mimesis that you've encountered just in kind of your day-to-day life that you thought were particularly uh illustrative of of the nature of this thesis yeah yeah i mean it's uh i, I like that example it's uh it's it's um relatable that everyone sort of has had that um situation and and that's yeah even even calling that a ritual i think that yeah that's really interesting and it, it is a ritual and a, a sort of a, a way to briefly share that spark of positive emotion um yeah, I mean, in terms of in terms of uh, mimesis in in everyday life, I mean, I think we see so much of it on on social media, um, and you kind of see it come and go. I mean, it, it waxes. And I, I see this every time. <laughs> I, uh, so, so the, the 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 social media platform that I, I spend most, you know, the the, the yeah the, the one platform that I use the most, probably too much, is Twitter, and it seems you know every every few months there's a new Twitter competitor. Mm-hmm. that is launched you know uh you know we've been talking about elon, elon musk buys twitter you know some some faction of the twitter using community is upset and then they go over to mastodon or they go over to this or that other platform the recent one is threads mm-hmm. you know i saw this chart of you know early in july when threads launched you know they had a huge spike in their user base and then after about two weeks it fizzled out and now it looks like it's sort of on the decline mm-hmm. and i just find that that phenomenon interesting where you know people regularly quit twitter go to this other thing and it's sort of you know once once enough public figures send that signal out there of like you know yeah high status people prestigious people are going to this other platform a bunch of other people go and i think it's fun for a couple of weeks and then it dies and then i think a lot of the prominent figures realize like oh twitter is still kind of the whatever the global online water cooler so they end up coming back and everyone follows them and then you know it's uh that i think that's sort of the online world is you know mimesis amplified by you know some huge number or some you know yes. it plays out all the time there yeah that's a great point it's almost like there's mimesis occurring between these social platforms too right everyone wants to be twitter but twitter has this center of gravity or network effect that that seems to be really hard to disrupt um mm. so it's very, very yeah. interesting stuff um yeah, and then are, are trying to do this right. Like, like there've been YouTube competitors that haven't gone anywhere. I mean, yeah, this yeah that center of gravity. That's a nice term that we just can't really get away from from these. I mean, m- maybe, but uh, at the moment, it seems like uh, the, the, they're, they're sort of too established, and 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 people are sort of there's too much inertia. Yeah, yeah, and I guess I would just like to leave the audience with it. I mean, this is a thesis is kind of hard to talk about, but it's very fascinating. I find it to be enriching my worldview as I get more into it. I see more mimetic dynamics in myself and in others. Um, you know, it, all this. You know, Gerard uses the term "model" a lot, right? Where you're sort of modeling your desire after someone else. They're desiring a thing, so therefore you're desiring a thing. And I think it explains why we even have things like actual models, right? Like you know, men and women wearing certain clothes or trying to get you to imitate them to go and buy more clothes from the brand or whatever it may be. So um, I appreciate you having this conversation with me today. This is just a rabbit hole that I continue to go down. So always good to bounce ideas off a guy like yourself. Yeah, Yeah. I really enjoyed it, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've uh, like, yeah, like I said, I find Gerard fascinating and it's so applicable to to so much of what we see. And, uh, And it seems like there's no... There's no bottom to that rabbit hole, right? Like, you know, I see it too in everyday life. Just um, that that mimetic idea that it really um, it really is everywhere. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Uh, Rob, thank you for doing this. Where can people find you on the internet? Uh, yeah, you can follow me on uh, yeah my Substack, robkhenderson.com, and on Twitter at robkhenderson. Awesome. Thank you again. Thanks, Robert.